guess we'll start with first the extra office hours. This is today, Monday. I've got a presentation that ends around 2.30. It might stretch to like 2.45, 3 o'clock, depending on how slow it goes and questions after. But 2.30 is when it's scheduled to end until 4. I'll just be in the office there. Tomorrow, Tuesday, uh, our agreed upon time is 1.30 to 4 p.m. Again, in my office. And Wednesday, that's in two days. This is the day before the final. Uh, 12 to 4 p.m. In my office again. And actually, as I think about it, this day I'll have to leave at about 3.45. Just a few minutes early. Got it. Ballerina. Well done. And Thursday, uh, our final is 8 a.m., 10 a.m. It's in the lecture centers. Right. So, I mean, it's going to be however how fast they fill up. So if you show up early, then you can go into the one where I'm going to usher my students. If you show up late and that room is full, too bad. You're in the other room. Okay? So, I, have, I don't know. Whichever room they tell me my students are going in, we'll all meet there beforehand and discuss that. Yeah? Um, what's the percentage that the final is like for our grade? Does that make sense? 25%? Is that right? Does that ring about people? 25 of the total. Yeah. So if, if you look on WebAssign, I haven't put the last quiz in yet, strategically haven't put it in yet. Um, if you take your grade on WebAssign, current, multiply it by 0.75, that gives you exactly your total credit amount. Then you take a random variable x, this is your final exam grade as a percentage, multiply it by 0.25. And this is your final outcome. So this line, you take your current grade on web assign as a percentage times 0.75, that's a number, plus 0.25x, this is a line of up certain slope. The different x values are the final score, like the final exam scores, and that can help you use, you know, predict what your final grade will be. Okay. Does that make sense? Like if you got a 100% on the final, you plug that here, and this equation tells you your final grade. Okay. Other questions? lectures. At this point, you should be pretty confident finding any derivative, right? We've got all these rules for derivatives. We've got product rules, quotient rules, chain rules. We've got sum and difference rules. We've even got the fundamental theorem of calculus, for goodness sake which says that the derivative of an integral is pretty trivial if you see, if you see what you're supposed to do, right? Replace a variable. Um, we've got all these different rules, and then we also have the very definition of what it is. And so as a fallback, maybe that's what we have to go to. Um, we also specifically know how to take, rule, uh, take derivatives of certain functions. So we've got these special functions. like polynomials, like logs, and exponentials, and 
trig functions, which we spent quite a lot of time, and even some time on their inverse functions. And there's more that we looked at, right? But these are special functions which um, we apply some of these rule to, rules to, and we get uh, some nice outcomes. And then immediately following this, we've got these things which are antiderivatives, right? Which I could basically list a bunch of stuff off for again. We've got rules for finding them, uh, such as rules for sums of functions, constants times functions. We've got um, fundamental theorem of calculus, which relates how to find it, the definite integrals um, and with these antiderivatives. And we've got uh, uh, this really handy tool called u sub that we looked at recently, just last time, that helps us compute things. And I've got a dot, dot, dot there. I don't want to write an S because this is like one of the rules or tools that we use. There's so many other tools that we didn't get into, which you're going to learn a lot about in calculus too. For antiderivatives, though, the big thing to keep in mind is if you have some function here that you take a derivative of, right, then that original function is the antiderivative of whatever you got after that process above, right? So f prime of x equals little f of x. This is the derivative of capital F. Capital F is the antiderivative of little f, right? Like these two things are intricately linked. Okay. Then we've got kind of the foundation of all this stuff. We've got limits. And there's all sorts of limit laws that we study. And we also looked at algebraic ways for simplifying limits so that we can then find the limits without you know, running into infinities or division by zeros. And then we also looked at a nice special rule of the Hoppy-Tolles rule for those special indeterminate cases. Etc. Um, then from all of these things, we made some applications. So the kind of the big important things that we saw were um, we saw optimization problems, maximize some function, minimize some function. We saw related rates questions. require a specific kind of derivative, the implicit derivative. And we saw curve sketching, finding where a function is going up, where it's going down, where it looks like an upside down parabola, where it looks like a right side up parabola, piecing things together, and lots of other things, right? Even these are very general terms for now, but is it possible that from these very general terms you could give me, hey, one of these, two of these, three of these would be great topics for review. What do you think? Can we do related rates? Okay, we've got a vote for that. Let's do it that way then. Let's uh, vote on applications in general. You can vote as many times as you want. You want to you see one of these? Just like everyone, except one. Okay, limits. You can vote as many times as you want. That's like everyone minus three, so, okay. 
antiderivatives. That's everyone minus a lot of everyone. That's about half. And derivatives. Just you two. Okay, so we'll start with some applications questions, and specifically we can go with a related rate question, right? And uh, we'll go from there, and then we'll do some limits questions after that. Okay? Okay, and again, if at any point in time you say, hey, the problems that you're doing are not good enough, okay? Not hard enough. I wish you would just stop talking because you take forever. I finished 10 minutes ago. Something like this, going through your brain, okay? I'm gonna have a book right here. This vertical line is the cutoff from the camera. So you won't even be seen, okay? I won't take it personally if, say, you walk up here immediately. What level of difficulty do you want to start off with? Like introductory? Like one out of three stars? here. So the radius of the sphere tells us what, our, what we're working with. Imagine that's a sphere. And we know for some given radius r, the volume of the sphere is exactly 4 thirds pi r cubed. We know these things are changing. If the volume is increasing, the radius is increasing. This whole sphere is blowing up. We need a way from this to get those rates built into the equation. The way to do that is implicit time derivatives. So we take d dt of v. And that's going to be the same as d dt of 4 thirds pi r cubed. How fast is the volume changing? Well, it's exactly the time derivative of that. We don't need to apply any extra rules. There's no power, there's no other function, we just know it's dv dt. So 
left side is just that. On the right side, we've got a couple constant multipliers, so we can take those out front. R cubed, that's a function of R. Right? You take a radius and you actually cube it. But R is also a function of time. So this is a function of time plugged into a function of r. That's a composition. So we need to apply the chain rule to this. So four, third, I'm just going to move on time. I keep arguing with myself internally. Four, third, it's pi. So we take the derivative of this with respect to r. Take the derivative of this with respect to r, and then we multiply by the derivative of what's inside as a function of time. Okay, that's implicit differentiation. Okay. Simplifying this result, we see that the rate of change of the volume is equal to 4 thirds times 3 is 4 times pi times the radius squared, times the rate at which the radius is changing. If we look at our question. We say, what is this number? That's the rate at which the radius is changing. We ask, what is this number? That's the diameter, which is twice the radius, and that's 80. So the radius is 40. With those data, we can exactly compute the rate of change in the volume. This is 4 pi times the radius squared times the rate at which that radius is changing. I'm not going to find the numbers, neither should you. That's it. Box that answer and you get full credit. Questions on that? This does look familiar, right? Okay, good. Yes? Can you just go over how you applied the chain rule again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so R is actually a function of time, right? Radius changes over time. So in order to tell me exactly what the radius is, I need to give you a time. And you plug that into your formula and you say, okay, here's the radius at that point. Right? Okay. But then what we've done is we've taken this other function. Um, and I, yeah, I can use that. And I've said it's r cubed, right? But this is actually a function. So as a function of time, That's what we've done. So to take the derivative of that, I need to apply the chain rule. D f with respect to r times dr with respect to t. Chain rule. Df with respect to r is 3r squared. The derivative of r with respect to time is just dr dt. inner struggle I had that you all witnessed, and I was mumbling to myself, that was me debating whether or not I should, should do that. I should have. Sorry. Other questions? Do you see my mistake? I didn't put labels at the end. Volume is millimeters cubed, right? And it's a rate.
you think about what all these things are. 4 millimeters per second. 40, oops, sorry, 40 millimeters, millimeters squared times millimeters per second, millimeters cubed per second. Next problem. Same level of problem, just straightforward problem. Same level of problem. Next level up. Okay, sorry, that one. If you want a simpler one, I'm going to move on. There's simpler ones right here. Okay, moving on. Yeah, if we keep doing this enough, even I'm going to be afraid when I read the question. So, that's not a bad thing. Some silly problems in here. Oh, this is this is fun. The person stands. Near the edge of a cliff. I'm gonna I'm gonna add here a tall cliff. Drops a stone. Here's the picture. A couple of muscles. Like massive forearms. And of course, they've got a tie that anchors them over here because the only thing with the stone that day without giving an anchor safely. And, uh, Exactly one second later, they drop another stone. Exactly one second later, how fast is the distance between those things? Clear? Person stands at the edge of the tall cliff, drop a stone, it starts falling. Then they drop another stone, it starts falling. Okay? And this is a one second interval in between. Then, in one second, the question is How fast is this distance between them changing? Okay, do you remember the acceleration due to gravity? Meters per second per second. So if you know this and if you just know that number, you can tell me the distance formula. You just take the antiderivative twice. 9.8 t. 4.6, 4, 9.8, uh, uh, 4. Point, you do the math. 9.8 over 4.6. Okay. 
over 2 t squared plus initial velocity times time. But if you're dropping it, there's no initial velocity. So the distance function is that in meters per second. Would we be expected to memorize the equation? Well, maybe, maybe not. The book gives you this one. This was something that I, I lectured on, right, as well. We're going through this process. If this is what it is in meters, right, distances in meters as a function of time, this is what you have. If you have it in feet per second, then it's, I said 32 feet per second per second, is that acceleration of gravity? I always taught these things in metric. So now we've got two distance functions, right? Distance of stone one, distance of stone two. How do we determine how far away they are? How do you find the distance between any two things that are traveling in the same line? Take two real numbers, one here, x2, x1. How do you find that distance between them? Here's zero. Subtract this minus that, right? Okay, what tells us this? That formula. Okay, time zero, the person drops the first stone. Okay? What tells us this? second stone's position. What tells us that? It's the same function, right? With a small, slight modification. What's the position of this stone at t equals 1? It's 0, right? The second stone is dropped at 1 second. So when t equals 1, x2 equals Zero. Right? Okay, look at the first, look at the function. What do you need to plug into to get zero? You need to plug in zero, right? So if I plug in one for t, I need to change it to zero. So that the position of the second stone is zero at time equals one. Right? So when I plug in 1 for the distance function, I get some value for x1 down here. At the very same moment, this value needs to be at 0. And then they just keep going. Clear? Yeah, okay. And then we're just going to do this. d of t minus d t minus 1. That's how far away they are from each other at any time. I'll call this capital D. We want to know how fast D is changing, capital D is changing. Do you care what we use, feet or meters? No? Okay. We're going to use feet. I like 16. Get 
two options at this point. Proceed as if you don't care and don't FOIL that thing out and simplify or multiply that guy out and simplify before pressing on. I'm of the former. So I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> okay. Some of you may be up the ladder. I don't know. Keep going. We'll do the other way. Okay. It, it simplifies down a bit. Let's take the derivative. So the rate at which the distance between them is changing with respect to time is just the derivative of that guy. 32t minus 32t minus 1 times the derivative of t minus 1, which is 1. Simplifying this guy, 32t minus 32t is nothing. Yeah? Minus 32 times negative 1 is positive 32. How fast are they moving away from each other? 32 feet every second. a lot trickier to even set up, right? Simpler to just do at the end. You've got some information in here that no one cares about. How fast are they moving away from each other in another second? 32. How about in 10 more seconds? 32. How about, in, how about at the end of the universe? 32. Right? Until they hit the bottom of whatever black hole they're being dropped into? 32. Interesting question when you think about traffic accelerating all from a stop at a stoplight. You know how the car is pulling away from you, in front of you, usually? Is it because they're accelerating faster than you? Like they push the pedal down further? Well, if you're accelerating at the same rate, the distance between you is going to increase just because you started your gas later than they did. That's what this says. Okay, questions on this one? Okay, harder question, same question level. Harder. Yes, you got one? No. Harder? Same level? New question type. When you stop voting, I think we need to do different questions. Different question type? Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. You've got your equation. You either take an implicit derivative, or you've got your explicit equation based on the variable you want to differentiate with respect to, and you just differentiate that puppy, and you're done. Okay. Next problem type, then. Um, I hope you wrote that short list down. It's been erased. Still on applications, there was optimization problems. There were curve sketching problems. Or do you want to move on to the other topic that was highly voted on, which was the uh, limits, right? Or the books here. <laughs> Application problem optimization. Okay, optimization problems, curves, sorry. Uh, application questions, curve sketching. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, more. Okay, so 
So nine there. How about moving on to limits? One, two, three, four. Okay, one curve sketching problem. Or two. We'll see where we're at. How gentle do you need this first problem to be? Should we just jump right in? Difficulty to the max? Yes. Yeah. No. no. Yes. yes. No. Um, well then, this one should be fun. Yes. This one will test everything you've got. So you're given a random function. Immediately you need to determine really one thing. Is it even continuous? That one thing can imply its possible differentiability, but definitely where you can even sketch its curve, right? So like when you draw your axes out, you need to know where you're going to draw the line. So first, we need to check domains and continuity. What's the domain of this function? So you handle it piece by piece. What's the first thing you do with the number that I give you in this expression? You plug it into sine, right? Okay, then you take that output, sine of the number I gave you, and you plug it into natural log. Right? So, what numbers can I initially plug into sine? Do I have any limitations? Right away, nothing, right? Sine can handle any angle. Okay, second, can natural log handle any output that sine gives us? What does sine output? Sine output's a number between what and what? Zero. Not zero and one. Negative. Negative one and one. But that's a problem, because natural log cannot accept anything except positives. So the only x's that are allowed, the only numbers we can plug in here, are only x's where Sine of x is positive. That's our domain. So we, from the very beginning, need to start eliminating variable values. Where is sine of x positive? Let's go in the first 0 to 360 degrees, or 0 to 2 pi interval. For what angles is it positive in here? Yeah? That's part of it. Keep going. Zero to pi. Perfect. So in this first circle, well, you start at zero, you go around the circle one time. In there, the only angles we can pick are zero to pi, and we cannot pick them, actually, because at zero and at pi, sine of x is zero. So we've got this. Right? How about the second time around the circle? This thing turns into a 2 pi. This thing turns into a 3 pi on our second uh, trip around the circle. 
on our third trip around the circle. This guy now changes to a 4 pi. This guy changes to a 5 pi. On our nth trip around the circle, what are the numbers on the left and on the right? This is the first time, this is the second time, this is the third time around the circle. On our nth time around the circle, we've got n minus 1 times First time. First time is zero. Second time is? Third time is? If I plug in one and I get zero, zero times two pi is zero, right? So first time gives us this. N minus one. One minus one is zero times 2 pi is 0. I plug in 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. 1 times 2 pi is 2 pi. Third time around the circle. 3 minus 1 is 2. 2 times 2 pi is 4 pi. Yeah? I get pi here. 3 pi here. 5 pi here. These are all odd numbers. Two times one is two, minus one is one, one pi. Two times two is four, four minus one is three, three times pi. Three times two is six, minus one is five, times pi is five pi. Okay, so we've got the numerical pattern now. So if n is any value, this is defined on a union of, of all of these things, all the intervals, n minus 1 times 2 pi, 2n minus 1 times pi. So I take all of the n's and the integers, I plug them in, and then I take the union of everything. That's just a succinct way of writing that. Yeah? Okay. If that doesn't make any sense, that's fine. That's, but this is what you see, right? And this pattern makes sense, so we'll get there. So on all of these little intervals, sign is positive. Good. That means we can plug it into natural log. How about we just pick one of those and see what it looks like? And the reason I say that is because sine repeats itself. Right? What sine is in here is exactly what it's going to be here and exactly what it's going to be here. So what we do for all of these pieces is graph the exact same thing. Clear? Okay, because we keep plugging the exact same thing into natural log, just over and over again. Okay. What do we use for sketching curves? derivatives. Natural log is a continuous function on its domain and it's differentiable on its domain. By only allowing our angle x to be in there, we're picking angles which give us a nice output within the domain of natural log, which means we can differentiate this guy in those intervals. So what's the derivative? Well, for natural logs, it's really easy, right? You take the derivative of what's inside, and 
you divide it by what's inside. That's the chain rule applied to natural logs, right? You've seen that before. What's its second derivative? That's the derivative of cotangent. If you remember it off the top of your head, fantastic. If you don't, you've got this, and you know the quotient rule. Derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, all divided by the bottom squared. This is sine squared plus cosine squared, that's 1, over sine squared of x, which is negative cosecant squared of x. Now we're going to start finding where the function is going up, where it's going down, where it's leveled off, where it looks like a concave up part, where it looks like a concave down part. And we're going to do it only in zero pi. Before I continue, sit down and just let you stare and then ask. I went pretty fast through all this. Into some complicated stuff. I know this is a hard problem. So, ask away. Yes. Okay, this graph is color coded. Um, blue parts are where the function is right in. Red parts where it's falling. And green parts where it's doing neither. It's leveled off entirely. Okay? Or it's changed direction sharply. So the blue parts where it's rising is where the first derivative is positive. The first derivative tells you the slope. If the function is rising, the slope is positive, so that means the first derivative is positive. The red part where it's falling is where the slope is negative. Okay. And then the green parts are either where there is no derivative defined. Okay, so like here. You can't differentiate there because it's a cusp. Same here, same here, same right there at the corner. But everywhere over here, it's flat. It's not going up, it's not going down. That's where the slope is zero. So it's either zero or it does not exist. That'd be green. Second derivative, I'm not even going to use this guy, except a part, just a piece of it. So focus now on just this falling red piece. If you sort of break this interval that I've just drawn in right here at the middle, you'll notice the left hand side, which is falling, looks like the left hand side on an upward facing parabola. You'll notice on the right hand side of this that it looks like a downward facing parabola, but just the right hand side of it. So this one 
is where the second derivative is negative. This right hand, this left hand side is where the second derivative is positive. Right at that middle point where it changes to where it's zero. We call it an inflection point, right? And there's other ones on this graph. You got one like right here ish coming up but not going up as fast and it's rising up and then it changes again here and starts coming back. parabola to an upwards and then back down. Okay. Other questions? Zero. Where's that zero? Specifically in zero to pi, right? Where's the first derivative positive, negative, importantly, where is it zero? Where's the second derivative positive, negative, importantly, where is it zero? And then, additionally, where is it not defined? At all of these points, zeros and undefined points, it might change from positive to negative. So we need to check. This is equal to zero exactly where cosine is equal to zero. Right? And it's undefined where sine is equal to zero. In here, sine is not zero from zero to pi, right? So it's not undefined anywhere in zero to pi. But cosine pi over 2 is 0, and pi over 2 is in there. There's no other zero value for cosine. So pi over 2 is our golden point here. How about here? Is this ever 0? No. Sine would need to be infinity. It's never infinity in here. Is it undefined anywhere? in 0 to pi. No. Because sine is only 0 at multiples of pi. Full multiples. 0 pi, 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi. And none of those are in here. Right? Okay. Does this get close to 0? As x gets close to 0 or pi, sine gets really close to 0, right? Which means this 1 over something close to 0 does get really close to 0. So this approaches 0 at the endpoints. That might be something of note. Right? Similarly, this approaches zero at the endpoints. That might impact what we draw. It tells us that our graph stops going up and down essentially at zero and pi, or comes close to it.
let's find the values of the derivative. Here, it's zero, right? So right there, it's at, it's at zero. At pi over two, the derivative is zero. From zero to pi over two, what do we have? What's the sign of it? From zero to pi over two, cosine is positive and sine is positive. Right, in the unit circle, if I pick an angle in here, it's above the x-axis and to the right of the y-axis. So we have a positive derivative over here, which means in general our function is rising on the way from zero to pi over two. From pi over two to pi, one of these angles in here. Cosine is negative, sine is positive, so the result of the ratio is negative which means our function stops rising and then starts falling. Our function's coming up, stops, and then starts falling. Yeah? Second derivative. has the same shape. Because it's never zero on this interval. Right? So we just need to check one point in here to see if it's always going to be positive or always going to be negative. So we plug in, say, pi over 2. That's a nice easy one. Or we don't even plug in anything and just look at what we have. Plug in pi over 2, you get sine is 1, right? This is negative 1 over 1, so it's negative. Or just look at what you have. You've got a squared thing. That's always positive. Being divided by a negative, or a negative being divided by positive. So it's always negative, no matter what you plug in. So what is the general look of our function? From 0 to pi. It's going up coming down, and it has this general shape. Right? So now if I give you a point, you can give me a, a sketch. Right? These agree entirely. So as a good guess, that's our curve. Something like this. We can check. A point. Our original function was natural log of sine of x. If we plug in just pi over 2, we have natural log of 1, which is 0. So, we got ourselves a point. We can check what happens to this graph at the endpoints now, right? Of that interval, just to see. So from here, I would adjust my curve using limits from as x goes to 0 and pi from the left and from the right. OK? But as a general curve sketch, there you go. And this function just repeats itself nothing in here. At 2 pi, it does the same thing, all the way to 3 pi. Nothing. And it repeats itself again at the next 4 pi to 5 pi, right? Over and over again. Yeah? How close was I, Hassan? You've got your computer on. See? He has spoken. It's perfect. So excited for Book of Boba. Can't wait. Can't wait. Yeah. Anyway, 
That's curve sketching. Take your function, find its domain. That's the first piece, right? Then find where it's differentiable and where it's not. Second piece, right? Take the first derivative, take the second derivative. Then check and see where it's going up, where it's going down, and what the general shape of it is using the first and second derivatives. Then take a stab at the overall picture. Right? If you need any help, this guy right here can help you because he's aced literally every curve sketching problem I've ever thrown at you, and they're like immaculately gone. And I know he can do it because he's done it without a calculator every single time. Sorry, I just volunteered you to choose it for me. So there's like 39 people that might come out or ask me for help, so now you can help. <laughs> okay, what's the next one you want to see? Is it time? It's got the time. Yes, there's time. Or questions? Fred? Can you do the integral stuff with the u? Yeah. The u substitution, integral stuff. Do, do all the people that voted for limits agree we can go to u substitution? All of n minus 2 of you? Or do we need to see limits? You can do limits. We've only got 10 minutes. It's probably only one question. We've hit our limit. Limit for U sub. U sub? We're good with U sub? Okay, we just did it though. So let me find something that's like harder. Unless we'll double be We'll double. Beginner, intermediate, advanced. Intermediate out here. Intermediate, good. Okay. Some reason they can pick an odd number between Yeah, between sine and cosine. That's what I was going to say. An odd number between sine and cosine. How about like uh, 37? It's a trick one. done this one either, so <laughs> here we go. What do you think? Do you know it off the top of your head? Or should we pick secant for you? Hassan says? Oh, Hassan says he's suggesting one plus secant. So if you ever see like a function plus a constant, it, it can be wise to just lump it in there. Okay, because the next thing you'll do is take the derivative, right? And you're going to hope that part of what's left is the derivative, right? Constants that are added on are killed by derivatives. So it's like getting, it's like going to the bank, taking a withdrawal, and they just give you an extra buck anyway. You know what I mean? Like here's your ten dollars plus one. So we could choose just secant, but then we're going to have one over one plus u. Let's just make it 1 over u. And let's hope this stuff turns into part of the derivative. So we're taking
taking the derivative of u with respect to the variable that's in there, which is theta. Okay. Um, if this theta messes you up and freaks you out, which I, I know it might, you feel free to replace this with an x, that with an x, this with an x, that with an x. It's, a, it's the same thing, okay? It's just a variable. Like that. Okay? Just rename it, which is totally fine. That's the use substitution that I've said that does nothing except change the name of the variable, which is fine. So what's the derivative of secant? That's the derivative of 1 over cosine. Quotient rule. Derivative of the top times the bottom. Minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is minus sine divided by the bottom squared. So it is sine over cosine squared tangent times secant. Sine over cosine squared, right? It can be written like this. That's tangent. This is secant. So, is that derivative anywhere in here? Yes, it's literally that thing. So, du dx is tangent times secant. That means if I multiply the dx over, I get du equals tangent x secant x dx. So, this is du. This is then 1 over u du. And that antiderivative is natural log of u. Right? And then substitute back in. Oh boy. I said it. Didn't write it. Doesn't change a thing after this. Derivative kills it. Okay. Question. Don't forget the constant of integration. Natural log of secant x plus 1. But you need to be careful. Right? You can't just plug anything into that. Fortunately, what you can plug into it is bounded by a, an asymptote down here. Okay. Two minutes. So this afternoon, 2.34 in my office, tomorrow afternoon in my office, Wednesday afternoon in my office, also tomorrow afternoon there's another calculus professor that will be recording the review session that they have. They're going to be posting it tomorrow afternoon on my channel because they don't have one and I have like 27 subs so I'm super popular. <clears throat> what do they call people that don't influence? Non I'm a non-influencer. Oh, good question. Yes, you can have a scientific calculator. No graphing calculator whatsoever. Okay? Other question, Fred? Sorry? I know I can take it without a calculator. If I ever came to a part that I needed to compute, I would box it and not compute it. So yeah, I know I can do that. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Huh? 
What else are we reviewing? So what else are we going to use for the primary? What else do we need to put down? Oh, you mean like pencil, paper, stuff like this, or like the material to study? Oh, room. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's lecture center seven, is that right? And 18 for the final. I'll look it up right now. Lecture Center 7 and Lecture Center 18. And I'll be out front, like before the test starts, okay? Um, do, you, do I need to set in my...